come up and talk to us about some more uh, emergency cases that we face in obese patients. And uh, I think I saw Virginia really, really up on those graphics there. So I think you have some experience with that. Thanks. Yeah, well, I guess I've got the reputation for taking care of fat folks. So. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, discuss the topic now of perforated small or large bowel in obese patients. And which one is the the PC one? Okay. No commercial interest to disclose. So let's just take an example. I mean, if we're going to talk about perforated duodenal ulcer, and we're going to think about how to treat it in obese patients, well, certainly we want to favor a laparoscopic approach. But essentially, the treatment and the repair are going to be very similar. Uh, you certainly want to drain the gutters well, uh, especially in obese patients that uh, don't have any abscesses and consider extra drains if needed. And that's sort of one example of how to do. And so I thought about the fact that, you know, really when it comes down to treating these problems between normal sized patients and obese patients, and someone were to call me in the middle of the night, I think my advice were to be basically the same, and that is just fix it. Uh, so uh, we could stop the talk now and save a lot of time, but I think I'll. Uh, I will go on and, and address some of the other uh, potential problems that you might see. So I'll talk about uh, perforated duodenal ulcer, perforated small bowel, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, colon neoplasms, diverticulitis, and then probably the most important thing, take-home lessons maybe are in terms of ostomy creation in obese patients. So back to duodenal ulcer, uh, you know, or, or just in general principles, obese patient populations, you can, the thing you need to know about these folks is that, uh, uh, and I'm sure you've, you've, in most of your practices, you've seen overweight patients, and certainly they're kind of like uh, patients on steroids and uh, patients who have psychological problems in terms of being able to hide intra-abdominal catastrophes. They can really brew up something pretty bad before they get really, really sick. And, and the problem is if they get really sick on you, you may not get them back. I think in all my 26 years of treating lots of obese patients, I've had only one obese patient ever uh, survive a code. And so if they get that sick, they're gone. And you really have to get them before they get to that point. Uh, they have significant pulmonary issues, uh, aspiration pneumonias, pneumonias, postoperative atelectasis uh, in obese patients are always a significant part of taking care of them when they're really sick. Uh, they also are high, high risk for soft tissue infections and problems uh, that you wouldn't un uh, necessarily have to worry about. In the normal weight patient, they can get insidious wound infections that then go on to become necrotizing uh, infections quite quickly. Imaging is a huge issue, especially when their BMI gets over 60, their weight gets over uh, 450 pounds, you can't get them in the CT scanner, ultrasound doesn't help very much, and there really isn't much you can do other than just fly by the seat of your pants, do interventional procedures, and you just really don't know what you're dealing with sometimes. And then, of course, intravenous access becomes a real challenge. Uh, if you've ever treated a lot of these folks, you really need to learn how to put a subclavian in with a really long needle because you can't get a neck line in and you can't get an arm line in and you can't get a femoral line in. Uh, general other operative principles, if you're going to take these folks to the OR, make sure that your operating table is, is appropriately uh, able to handle the patient. We have 1,000 uh, pound tables that have hydraulic limits and can, can move with that and that's really what you need. You need to secure the patient, put footboards on, strap them down well because you're probably going to turn them and use gravity to help you when you have the really obese patient because retraction becomes a huge issue and exposure becomes a huge issue. Never, never rely on human retractors. I mean, that should have gone out 30 years ago. You ha especially in this patient population, you absolutely have to use mechanical retractors. You can't rely on, on human force. It just won't work. Uh, adequate exposure is the key. Uh, and you just have to learn how to get it in obese patients. There are certain tricks you learn, but, but like I said, some of the main things are using gravity, using it tables, using retractors, and getting the exposure you need to get where you want, especially in the upper abdomen or the lower abdomen. Uh, in terms of laparoscopy, you've heard already some of the, Dr. Romanelli, I think, uh, addressed things very nicely, but don't forget to use extra long trocars. And I always tell my residents, never hesitate to put in more trocars, especially in the obese patient, because that'll oftentimes let you pull tissue down, get it away. We frequently use five trocars in a lap coli and just because we need to get the omentum down with the extra trocar. And that's, uh, it, the patients, there's no difference in morbidity, uh, and they do just as well. Uh, for good, I don't think that you should think about single port uh, unless it's for using both hands in the patient with a BMI over the 50. I just don't think it works very well. Uh, and uh, it's just not, not really uh, very effective. So let's go on to another situation. Let's say you have small bowel and you've got a bad situation with gangrene. 
uh, and you've got an obese patient in the OR with small bowel gangrene. Well, certainly if it's a vascular etiology and, and severely obese patients do have significant incidence of vascular disease, and it's not uncommon to, to have them uh, have uh, vascular problems. Well, you have to treat the perfusion issue just as you would with, in terms of any other bowel um, ischemia uh, and addressing that in terms of vascular reconstruction, having a catheter in, doing perfusion, doing uh, arteriography and so forth, getting that fixed uh, so you have to take care of the vascular etiology. Uh, if it's a mechanical etiology like an internal hernia and an, an ovulus, then obviously you have to address that, resect the bowel. Uh, and most of the time, uh, you're going to wind up in this situation with some resected bowel and some marginal uh, compromised bowel you're not sure about. So you just about almost, you have to decide you're going to do a second look operation. I definitely would advocate in the severely obese population that you, it's preferential to do a second look operation rather than trying to uh, do an ostomy because ostomies are just difficult and you're better off uh, just putting the bowel back together the next day uh, rather than trying to do a stoma. If you get into the severe, severely obese patient, you have to do massive enterolysis and you wind up four hours later or six hours later with about six enterotomies and a bunch of beat up bowel. Well, I think the strategy really is that you now, you've got to eliminate as many uh, defects in the bowel as possible, limit the number of anastomoses you have, remember that your limits in terms of small bowel have to be at least 100 centimeters of a viable bowel with an ileocecal valve and 150 to 180 centimeters if you don't have an ileocecal valve. Uh, and don't be afraid to take out a little small bowel if that gets you to that point. Uh, I would prefer to bypass uh, really severe distal obstructions uh, rather than do an ostomy in this patient population. Inflammatory bowel disease. Well, you don't see many folks with uh, ulcerative colitis and severe obesity, so that's not really a big issue. But you do sometimes see Crohn's patients. And uh, their treatment basically is very similar to the normal weight Crohn's patient. You just have to take care of the disease, resect it as necessary, and again, uh, probably try to avoid an ostomy if at all possible, and use the same principles as normal weight patients in terms of the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease with medical management perioperatively. C. diff colitis has now become a new entity that we have to deal with. You'll occasionally see a perforated one, but usually you want to get to them before they get perforated uh, and aggressively treat these folks with uh, both flagellin, vancomycin, intravenously, and enterally. Uh, megacolon can develop, and then if you have to get them to the OR, go ahead and do your total abdominal colectomy. And my strong advice to you would be uh, to refer them to your colorectal colleague to hook them back up later, because working in the pelvis in a really big patient is no fun. Uh, colonic neoplasms. Uh, you know, you can colonoscope a severely obese patient just like a normal weight patient. So you really want to be pretty aggressive and liberal with doing your polypectomies and multiple, multiple colonoscopies rather than surgery, if at all possible. If you get a polyp that you can't get out with multiple attempts, then I think you need to tattoo it really well and, and then go after it operatively. Uh, laparoscopy is ideal if you can, but sometimes it's not possible. Certainly, if, if possible, it should. Uh, if you do have to take out a significant amount of colon, I would uh, 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 try to avoid an ostomy if at all possible and, and maybe even need a total abdominal colectomy, which uh, technically is a little easier to, to hook up the sigmoid to the, um, I mean to the, the rectosigmoid to the ileum rather than trying to hook up uh, up in the mid-abdomen. Uh, diverticulitis, uh, probably the most common colon condition we see in terms of inflammatory disease. Basically, the same conservative strategy, managing these patients perioperatively uh, beforehand in terms of, uh, um, of, uh, of treatment. You heard in the plenary session earlier today about the advantages of washout and so forth uh, if using a laparoscopic approach. But I think if you need to do an emergent resection uh, you, and you do need to create a diverting ostomy, then I think your choices should be to go to doing either a loop ileostomy or a transverse loop. Uh, because uh, doing any kind of a sigmoid uh, colectomy, a sigmoid um, um, ostomy becomes very difficult in uh, this patient population. I think if they're this big and they're that inflamed, you probably want to use preoperative ureteral stents, much as I hate to do those. I think it is worth taking the time in this situation to do it. And uh, I, if you, when you're taking these ostomy down, if you're putting these folks back together, I, I, I call it a Humpty Dumpty uh, reconstruction because you really do need all the king's horses and all the king's men to get these folks put back together again in, in the pelvis. That's a really big deal operation. So uh, a few words about ostomies. If I, if I can give you any probably uh, uh, words of experience and advice about how to take care of these folks, um, probably ostomies are one of the areas that people make some mistakes and, and hopefully you can avoid them uh, and I can help you do that. 
Uh, don't forget, ostomies have to be seen by the patient to be, f to be f uh, maintained and, and taken care of. So when you think about a severely obese patient, when they stand up, there's this giant mountain. Never, never put the ostomy on the downhill side because I mean, they just can't see it. They have to have a mirror to try to fix it and so on. So you just can't. So you can just never even think about the lower part of the abdomen for several reasons. Not only is it, uh, is it thicker uh, and the upper abdomen is thinner, so that's advantageous. But if you think about it, I and mean, obese patient stands up, I mean, you saw the pictures that uh, in, in the last talk, the, the abdomen can go down like 9 to 10 to 12 to 15 inches in the lower abdomen, and your ostomy will get a huge amount of tension put on it. If you didn't sew it in, it'll be gone. It'll be back in the abdomen. And if it isn't gone, it'll have a lot of ischemia, and it might, uh, might infarct. So uh, lower abdominal uh, ostomies in big patients just don't work, and they're not a good idea. Uh, so locate the ostomy always within the rectus that does decrease your incidence of prolapse and avoid irregular surfaces because if you know anything about ostomies, you know this the wafer and the ostomy appliance has to fit over a flat surface. And if you have an irregular surface, it's going to leak and be a problem forever. So to do an ostomy in an obese patient, you have to have more mobilized bowel than you would in a normal patient because there is going to be that retraction. There's going to be some more tension. You have to have the bowel well above the skin. I mean, not just a little bit. You have to have it really well above the skin. So you have to go a bit beyond what you would for the normal-sized patient. I think in the obese patient, I always tell my residents, you have to suture the, uh, the bowel to the fascia because there is that retraction. And you, you need to make sure it doesn't go away and get back into the abdomen. Uh, also, when you make these, uh, the ostomy opening, um, in an obese patient, you probably have to make it a little bigger than you need to just to get the bowel through without injuring it. And so you need to take the time then to close that fascia down. And, cl and that's the best time to do it because you don't want to come back and have to fix a paracolostomy hernia in a year. Uh, it's not really a great operation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the Brook technique, obviously, for making the ostomy on the outside is appropriate. Uh, and uh, make sure there's no signs of ischemia when you finish making your ostomy before you leave the OR. If it looks a little purple and you're in the OR, it's going to look black the next day and you're going to be really unhappy. So make sure it looks good before you leave. So what about the really impossible ostomy in the really big patient? If you get their frozen abdomen or it's hard to mobilize the bowel, the mesentery shortened. Uh, well, the things you can do, you can tr consider going more upstream and mobilizing the small bowel up further if you have to do that. Uh, the second thing, and I've done only in a few times in my career, but it, it absolutely will work as a last resort, is I've actually split the abdominal wall from the midline, made a transverse incision over to where my ostomy hole is going to be, take the bowel, lay it up against the abdominal wall, suture it to it, and close that transverse defect. Try to get the skin closed well because obviously you want a flat surface, but sometimes that's the only way you can make an ostomy in a really, really uh, bad abdomen, and, uh, and you just have to do it that way. So incisional hernias, if you operate on big folks, you're going to get them. Uh, we heard a lot about it in the last talk, so I will just add a couple more points. Uh, see, if, if you make a midline incision, the bottom of the incision is about three quarters more likely to get a hernia than the top of the incision, and it's just because of gravity and pressure. Uh, you have to really uh, make sure that you close your fascial sutures well and lose lots of sutures per inch when you're doing these things. Avoid infection on the fascia and err on secondary uh, skin closures. So if you, if you do a perforated bowel in an obese patient, you almost never are justified closing the skin. You should close it by secondary intention or delayed closure just to avoid wound infections. Our paracolostomy hernias are probably, in my opinion, far and away the most difficult bowel problem in the obese patients. Uh, when people come in with, the, uh, with their ilial loop, uh, obstructed from a hernia, and they have to have nephrostomy stents, and they look uh, like some of the, I'm sorry I don't have any nice pictures, but you saw some in the, um, uh, in the last uh, talk with really large patients. But uh, they're really difficult patients to fix, and paracolostomy hernias are even worse than just general hernias, because so, you have the ostomy to work uh, with and take care of and move or not. And so my advice is if they, if they come to you when they're small, don't ignore them, fix them early. Uh, you do have to emphasize weight loss. I have done several patients with staged bariatric operations, and, and I think in that situation you, you don't do something permanent, uh, temporary. You have to do a more durable operation like a bypass uh, and to really get long-term weight loss and keep it off, because otherwise I'll gain weight in a year or two and be back with the same hernia. Uh, so if you do use mesh, make sure it's not contaminated or have any risk of getting against the bowel and, and uh, working into the bowel. I think laparoscopy with mesh is a nice option if you can do it. Uh, and like I said, the worst ones will probably need a staged bariatric operation. 
Uh, drain wound infections, if you get them, uh, wound infections in big patients can be insidious and lead to, like I said before, significant necrotizing fascial defects if you don't realize it. I see, a lot, I see patients that have been treated with PO antibiotics by their family doctors to, for two weeks and come in, and it doesn't look so bad on the skin, but when you open it up, you find about 10 inches of necrotic fascia underneath, and so you really have to aggressively treat these wound infections. So in summary, I'd say the underlying treatment of the diseases from perforation really is not that different in obese patients, but the things that you really have to watch for and do differently are to try to avoid ostomies whenever possible, and when you do construct them, construct them with the principles I mentioned, and really be careful about hernias and wound infections. Thank you.